Well, good morning again. Um, I'm not speaking today, and that's because we have a special guest with us this morning. Uh, you might remember uh, I hit the ground running back in August, and, and when I got here, our staff ha- had been in a little bit of a transition for a few years, and, and Slade, our associate pastor at the time, had announced uh, earlier last year that at some point he'd be leaving staff, and that happened this fall. And so uh, when I got here and was just kind of getting settled and getting the lay of the land and kind of looking ahead down the road of um, some of our open positions and and how I would staff, I approached the elders and uh, the deacons to get approval for a job description of an associate pastor for ministries. And uh, and, and that was back late uh, in the summer, early fall, around September or so. And then I picked up the phone and called somebody immediately that I wanted uh, to see if they would come and interview for the job. And it was a guy uh, that I had just hired six months before that. Uh, Last year when I was uh, in Kansas, I'd spent about six or seven months trying to hire an associate pastor, finally hired him uh, in March, and then appropriately left him four months later uh, to come to fellowship. And... uh, and, and and so anyway, I pick up the phone in September and, and I call Clay. His name's Clay Smith. I'll I'll bring him up here in a minute. And I called Clay and I just said, um, "Hey man, we've got this job here, and and you know I'd love to see you uh, throw your name in into the hat and interview for it." And he's like, "No," <laughs> and I was like, "Wait, what?" Um, he said, "You know, uh, I just think where this church, River City Church, the church that I'd left and that he had just come to was." Uh, in a place that that needed him to stick around uh, for a season, and he just didn't feel good about uh, leaving them in a lurch and and stepping down. And so I was like, okay. And I was severely disappointed, and it was sackcloth and ashes for me for a few days. Uh, and then I, I told the elders, and and we decided to open up the search, and uh, we opened up the search, got uh, over forty, I think, applications and resumes, something like that. And just as we were narrowing down the process about to stop our search, uh, I got a text one day from Clay in November, and it said, "Uh, is that job still open? And I was like, I don't know. Is it? No, I'm kidding. I said, yes, it is. Um, Would you like to throw your name uh, in the hat? And he said, yes, I would. And uh, just uh, God had led them to a place there that they were feeling like they were um, at least considering their options. And uh, and so anyway, uh, we narrowed that list down to about eight or ten, ran those names by staff and elders and through a, a process of attrition and watching the cream rise at the top. We got to two top candidates and interviewed multiple times, both of these candidates and, and Clay just emerged uh, throughout this process as our top candidate. And so we brought him in this weekend um, for a candidating visit. He is met with our staff. He has met, met with all kinds of people in our church. He met with the elders last night. He was with the deacons this morning. Uh, and so it's my privilege to introduce to you uh, my friend and hopefully a co-worker at some point in the future, uh, Clay Smith. Clay, why don't you come at this time? Thank you, sir. All right. Well, I mean, that was a, a glowing introduction. We can just wrap this up and head out. I, I think I like how that turned out. Um, like Pastor Alex said, my name is Clay. Um, I am married to my beautiful wife, Heather. We've been married for 19 years. Uh, we got married January 1st on purpose. I don't forget our anniversary ever. Everybody <laughs> celebrates it with us. And so this next one will be the big 20. And so she's put up with me for 20 years. I tell everybody I've been making her life better for 19 years. That is absolutely not true. Uh, it's the other way around. Uh, we have three daughters. Um, we have Abigail, who is 17. She graduates high school in just a couple of months. She's going to go out and attack the world. We have a middle daughter named Alyssa. She is 15, going on 40. If I ever have questions, uh, she's real quick to tell me the right way to do things and what she thinks. So thank God for her. And then we have our youngest, who is 11. Her name is Adeline Grace. And so she is just sweet as can be. She still thinks I'm the coolest guy in the world, so she's pretty high on my list, too. Um, Heather loved the A names. I wanted a Piper to throw in there, but we wanted to keep it confusing and tongue twistery. So we have Abby, Allie, and AG because she's Adeline Grace. So that's my family. Uh, we're going to share, I'm going to share a little bit of my story today. We're going to dive into Matthew uh, chapter, chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, uh, which may be a verse that a lot of you are familiar with. Um, but we're going to go over that this morning, and then I'm going to tell my story and then kind of tie that together. 
and then what that looks like moving forward. So if you guys would turn with me to Matthew chapter 28, uh, what's going on here is Jesus has been crucified, he's died, and he's resurrected. Mary has gone to the tomb and finds an angel there, and he says, you're looking for somebody that's dead. He's not here. He is risen. And so she's going back to tell the other disciples, and they see Jesus on the street, and he says, tell them to meet me in Galilee. And so Mary and the other Mary go, and they tell the disciples what they've seen, and eventually they all meet Jesus, and Jesus gives them what we now call the Great Commission. And he tells them, it says in, in, in chapter 18, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So Jesus is giving his followers, his disciples, a command on what they should do. He's telling them, I'm leaving, you need to go and make believers, disciple people, build the body. That's the Great Commission. And so we're going to park it right here for just a second. We're going to take a little detour and go over the not-so-interesting life of Clay, but I think it's important to, for you guys to know who I am, where I'm from, and more, most importantly, what I'm about. And then we're going to tie this together and see what that looks like as we move forward uh, in, in, the, in the time to come. So my name is Clay. I am 40. One or two, I can't remember. I'm getting to that age where I'm like, I'm 40-something. Heather tells me all the time, you're, what am I? 41. I'm 41 years old. She's 42, so I like older women, um, and she's robbing the cradle. Um, I was born in Andrews, Texas, uh, way out west. My dad worked in the oil field, so we moved all around west Texas. I lived in El Dorado, Andrews, Midland, Brankin, the you know garden spot of the universe, Rankin, Texas, but moved a lot. Uh, by the time I got to sixth grade, I'd been to about 15 to 20 different schools, and so we were, we were on the move often. When we got to sixth grade, we stopped, uh, and, and we lived in Brownwood, Texas, and so oh, technically, Brownwood was the big city. Uh, I lived in May, Texas. May, Texas had a population sign that just said May. There was no population we had a blinking light that went through the middle of town in a general store. Uh, my school had around 200 people, K through 12th grade. A couple of classes before me, the graduating class had four. It was three ladies and one guy. And so we were pushing the envelope. When I got there, I had 23 students in my class. And so we were huge. They didn't know what they were going to do with us. And so I lived in May all the way through high school. So I played all the sports. I played Football, basketball, baseball, track, because it made me, I, I didn't, I, I've never enjoyed running, and I dabbled in a little bit of golf, and so when I graduated high school, uh, I got a golf scholarship to a little, little college in Kansas, Central Christian College, and I went to play golf there. Now, I'm going to pump the brakes for just a second. Growing up, I grew up in a Christian home. Uh, my dad was a deacon at our church. My mom uh, was a part of the, the hospitality team. She would make the cookies and the things and all the stuff I love to go eat and snag between service. My mom was a part of that. And so I grew up in church my whole life. Moving around, I was part of a lot of different churches. Um, but we settled in May, and, and I went to church there my whole life. I came to know Jesus as my Savior at a young age. I knew that I was a sinner. I knew that I needed a Savior. What I didn't do was follow Jesus until much later on in life. I'm talking, I'm an adult, I'm a father, way later in life. So from young adult or high school to married guy, lots of bad choices. And we're going to talk about some of those this morning. Um, I go to college in Kansas. I find out that golf is super fun when you're playing it for fun. It is not fun when you play it for a job. They had me play, I played 36 holes of golf a day, and then I would go to class and then I would come back and we would work on short game putting and stuff like that. The worst part of all of it is I was used to grabbing a cart and living my best life. And the coach told me that carts are for coaches and parents. And I was neither one of those. And so I had to walk 36 holes of golf a day. And I just thought, well, this, this is not for me. I'll just play this on Saturdays on my own time. And so I did. I left. Um, I left uh, Kansas and came back to Angelo State. 
uh, spent a little bit of time there. I would stay at a school until they would flunk me out, and now I'd have to go talk to the dean of admissions. They'd put me on probation. I'd wait a semester. I'd get back in. I'd go party a little bit more, and then I'd get kicked out, and then I would go to Howard Payne. And I would go, I did that at Howard Payne. Um, I did that at a couple of different places, so I'm a social butterfly. I saw a lot of different uh, brilliant universities and institutions in Texas. Didn't finish at any of them. Um, at some point, you have to go to work. They don't let you keep coming back. And so I started working in Brownwood. There was a church camp there that was close to my house. I lived on the lake, and they needed a lifeguard. And I thought, as a younger guy, I was like, man, that's a great deal. I don't really have to do anything. And there were so many chicks. If you're a lifeguard, there were so many chicks at the, at the pool. So I did that. Um, but then I would stay on uh, during the year when campers would leave, and I would do events for, like, Alcoholics Anonymous, clean dorms, facilities, maintenance, whatever they would have me do. And one year, there was a new person on staff. Heather had come to that camp her whole life. And so she was about to graduate college and thought, I always have a summer job. I'm going to go grow closer to Jesus and serve and, and be a part of the church camp. And then she met Clay. And I thought, man, this lady is the prettiest lady I have ever seen. So I found every reason possible to hang out in the office all summer long. I didn't do a whole lot of lifeguarding. I didn't do a whole lot of facilities. I didn't do a whole lot of maintenance. I did a whole lot of relationship upkeep, right? I was, I was pitching my pitch, and I was hoping she was going to catch my catch, right? And thankfully, I don't know if it's because of poor judgment on her part or uh, divine intervention, but she actually decided to pursue a relationship with me. And so we started our very long and intense courtship. We met in May, and we got married in January of the same year. And so it was a very fast, quick process. I thought we were so forward-thinking, uh, and we were doing such a great thing. Her dad and mom had some reservations, and I thought they were the most closed-minded people on the planet. Fast forward 20 years, and three daughters later, I would have wrung my neck. <laughs> I tell her dad constantly, you are such a great man because I literally would have killed young me. So what I thought was okay then, it's definitely not okay. But, like I said, I don't know if Heather is stubborn or if God has shielded her, but we stuck it out. And I think it's because she's stubborn. Uh, she didn't want to prove her mom right and everybody right saying, this guy is nuts and he's a terrible idea. Because, remember, I've been making terrible decisions. That didn't, like, getting married didn't fix me. Now, I know Heather saw potential but let me tell you, young ladies and young men, if you're thinking about getting married, do not choose your spouse based on potential, right? They're showing you who they are right now. You may think you can fix them, but odds are not in your favor. Now, I'm a testament to God being able to redeem and, and, and salvage anything, but don't gamble on that with your future, right? Okay? So, Heather and I are married. She has just finished college. She's a choir teacher. Uh, she got her first job in Odessa, Texas, so we moved again to the garden spot of Odessa, Texas. Lots of oceanfront property out there. Um, she's teaching middle school choir, and I am doing uh, the Lord's work. I'm doing repossessions. I, love, I loved every bit of that job. I'm an adrenaline junkie, and so I got to legally steal people's cars. And you would be surprised. Business was a-booming. And so I got, I mean, cars, boats, Winnebago's. It was the whole shebang. A little dangerous, but a lot of fun. And so I would do that. Eventually, I moved into the office side of that. And so if you had your car uh, repossessed, you would call me. And I would, I would tally the fees and walk you through the process. You would pay me. I'd tell you where your car was, all of that jazz. Um, it was through a financial institution. Um, I was doing that. And then I started doing some collections work, people that were behind on their payments. And so uh, I don't know if you can tell from that. But my default setting is not super sweet. Uh, I don't mind confrontation. I don't look for it. But I'm, I'm comfortable in that situation. And so that kind of personality without Jesus doesn't lend itself to a, a nice, happy person to be around for the general public or for a spouse. Uh, we had one newborn at this point. Well, two. We had two. The middle one was born. Uh, I would say on average every night of the week, I was home maybe one night a week. Um, I would come home late, 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 go to bed, and then I'd get back up. I was either out repoing cars, which, I mean, that's part of the business, but I was also out hanging out with my friends. And when I say hanging out with my friends, I mean drinking, 
drug use. Um, there were some very, very bad choices that I made. Now, when I share my story, I hate it. It's a two-edged sword. It's embarrassing, right? I don't want to ever put on a pedestal that behavior, right? But if I can share that story, and it's not about me, but Jesus, right? This is my life before Jesus. I meet Jesus. This is my life after Jesus. And so right now, we are strongly, firmly in the before Jesus, okay? I was running around doing all sort of terrible things. Come to find out, making decisions like that has consequences. I have kids. I've been in youth ministry. I tell them all the time, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. That's what's going to happen, right? So I was playing stupid games. And one day in 2019, I had a stroke. And it wasn't uh, it, wasn't, it, was, it wasn't a freak thing. I was putting things in my body that increased blood pressure, and eventually those vessels pop, and you have a problem. And so through that stroke, I had to relearn how to, I couldn't walk, I couldn't talk, I lost complete use of the right side of my body, I had like a walker cane situation going on, and I'm, this is 2009, I don't know how old I am, but I wasn't as old as I am now, so I was like in my 30s, I think. Not normal. Through that situation, God got a hold of my life. I've told people this weekend so far, like, it wasn't a burning bush situation for me. Like, I didn't have a revelation, and all of a sudden, everything was different in Clay's life, but I was quiet and had to listen. And so God started working on my heart, chipping away at what I had built up, those walls that had come up in my life. And so Heather and I, had left Midland, and we've now moved to Stephenville, Texas. I don't know if you're familiar with where that is. It's about 60 miles southwest of Fort Worth. Uh, Tarleton State University is there. They just went Division I, so we get spanked all up and down the field by Division I schools. Um, but that's, that's, what, that's where we were. Uh, there was a, a church plant there. It had 50 people in it. And Heather was pregnant with our third child, and so she's going to the doctor, um, and the doctor there, the nurse, and the receptionist all go to this church plant. And they're inviting Heather. And so then Heather invites me. And then I get snaked into going to <laughs> doctor's appointments because I'm a great husband. I love doing it. But she would drag me, and I would go, and they would invite me. And finally, I was like, if you ladies will leave me alone, I'll go to church. One time, just leave me alone. And so I go to this church, and surprisingly, like nobody was shaking their fist at me, telling me how awful I was. Um, I don't really remember anything about that church. Like, it wasn't the strong theology or the great preaching, sorry. It wasn't the worship. I don't remember anything about that. I remember there was a group of men there that wanted to hang out with me. And so we had been, they had been donated a building, and they were doing some remodeling on that building, and they needed help working on it. So they're like, hey, Clay, you want to come hang out? We've got Chicken Express. And I was like, by all means, if Spoiler alert, if you need me to do something and you've got food, I am there, no matter what. We were doing some plumbing stuff. It was stinky and gross, but Chicken Express, baby, I'm there. So I go, and they keep doing things like that. Hey, we're just going to go hang out. Hey, you want to go check this out? What I didn't know is the whole time these men, they're doing it on purpose. They're pouring into me. They're discipling me. And there's a relationship built, and that's the key. They built a relationship with me. I knew these guys cared about me personally. It wasn't about church. It wasn't about theology. It was about they, they love me. They care about me, what's going on in my life. And so I go to church. Every time they'll open the doors, I'm at church. I get connected. I want to serve. I want to be a part. So I'm on the parking team, which is awesome in the spring, not awesome in the summer. It's hot, right? In the winter, you're like, Ugh. or it rains. I'm the guy with the umbrella walking people into church, like, so glad you're here. I just wanted to be a part. Then I start serving in kids right? Like, not fun kids. Not, let me, <laughs> young kids, the ones that poop and pee on themselves and on you if given the opportunity. Like, wherever I could be a part, that's where I was. And so God, that's where God really got a hold of my life, right? That's when I went from knowing Jesus to following Jesus. There's a huge difference. Hell will be full of people that knew Jesus, right? It's the ones that follow Jesus, that's the ones that matter. And so that's when I started to follow Jesus. That's when my life changed. That's when my family changed. That's when everything changed for my family. And so I'm, I'm in this church. 
I'm praying about what God wants for my life. At this time, I'd gone back to school and gotten a degree in respiratory therapy. Somebody told me it would be easy. Somebody lied to me. There was so much math involved and pressure and volume, and I was like, what in the world? I'm too far in to quit, but holy cow. So if you're thinking about respiratory therapy, there's a lot of math. If you think it's easy, it's not easy, right? Just a free tidbit there. But it paid well. It was highly stressful. Um, And so I was like, God, what do you want for my life? For the first time ever, not what I want. What do you want, God? What would you have me do? And so God started working in my heart, and and I'm like, maybe he's calling me into ministry. I hope not, because that sounds like a whole lot of no fun, but maybe, God, whatever you want. And so I'm praying with Heather about that. I I start talking to the pastor there at Timber Ridge, and he's like, why don't you start to intern? I said, that's great. I'll learn all the things. He's like, yeah, go get us some coffee, and we'll have staff meeting on Monday morning. Have that there and be ready. And I said, okay. So I started doing intern things at Timber Ridge Church. Through that, I I thought, you know, to be a pastor, I need to go to school. That's what Jesus would do, right? He would have me go to seminary. So I go to Liberty uh, because it's online, and I've got a family and a full-time job, and so that's very convenient for me to be able to do that. So I, I go to Liberty, and as you get closer to finishing at Liberty, they start to send out your resume all over the country. And so we had a little church in Black Mountain, North Carolina call us. They needed a student pastor. And so Heather and I prayed about that. They were great people. We decided to go to North Carolina and start our life in ministry together. It was a great church. I think it was founded in like 1840 or 60. It was a long time, and I think some of the original people were still there. Great people, but it was an older church. Um, They loved Jesus. They loved kids, and it was a great time and season of ministry for us. Of course, I thought things were going on there that it was just like so crazy uh, that's what people think in their first year of ministry, and you find out those things aren't that big a deal, right? Uh, but it was, it was a great situation. I still talk to Pastor Brent to this day. Uh, great guy. He actually talked me into singing in a quartet once, which if you know me, you know that's crazy. Um, but through that time, I had become great friends with the pastor in Stephenville. We were friends personally outside of church, and so he called me once and said, hey, I we've got something we want you and Heather to pray about. We've got an open position in the children's ministry. We need somebody to come in here and take over our children's ministry. Um, Just need to know up front that there's no money. I said, that's fine. I didn't get into ministry to get rich. Heather and I can talk about maybe some changes we need to make, what we need to do. And he said, no, no, I don't think you're hearing me. I mean, no money. Like, we're not going to be able to pay you at all. I said, okay, well, that is a little different. Um, what they did have was a house. A duplex had been donated to the church. They had changed. They've, they've been growing so much that they have outgrown their buildings. And as they would get a new one, this one had a, a, a what do you call it, or a parsonage. Um, and so they had had uh, college interns living in it, which means it was in tip-top shape, right, when we get there. <laughs> but they would let us live there for free, and we did. And I think our kids call that now the flea house because we had lots of roommates, and we could not get rid of them. But we were there. Um, we, Heather is a music teacher, and in a small town, I'm sure you know someone has to die or retire for her to get a job, and that had not happened in Stephenville. And so she was teaching English to Chinese kids in China over the internet, and that's the only source of income we had. Um, and that wasn't a lot. So we had a home. We sort of had food, um, but we felt like that's where God had us, and so that's where we served. Um, it ended up being a great, a great situation and position for me. Uh, we come, we, start, we take over the children's ministry at Timber Ridge. Uh, that church that had started out at 50 people in the ballroom of the old Holiday Inn, the, the Cutting Horse Saloon actually, went from 50 to about 2,000 people a week. Um, that's every day. And then we had our priesters come on Christmas and Easter, and it would balloon to between 3,000 and 3,500 people in a town of 15,000. So it was crazy how fast we had grown. It was crazy how big we had grown. But we were all used to being pastors at a church of 200. And there's a huge difference in pastoring a church of 200 and pastoring in a church of 2,000. And so it was difficult, but also I got to learn a ton of things. I started in kids' ministry, but I ended up being in charge of guest services, uh, facilities, Um, hospitality, basically anything in the church outside of worship on Sunday morning, because nobody here, including myself, wants me up here helping with worship, right? There's four or five words that I hate. 
Four words that I hate. That's not my job. But trust me, you don't want me helping with worship. But uh, we, we uh, serve on staff at Timber Ridge Church for about seven years. Um, eventually, um, some, some, some things had come up at Timber Ridge with the pastor and his wife, and uh, he had asked her to come on as a co-lead pastor. Um, we were a non-denominational church, but we came from the SBC, and so that went over like a lead balloon, and we were asked to leave the SBC, and so there was a lot of stress and kind of turmoil and strife for them as a couple uh, through that situation, and then that bled over for us as a church and as a staff. It just got unhealthy, uh, and it got kind of unhealthy, and so at at a certain point, I was like, I'm going to step back from ministry for a little bit. I don't know if this is where I'm called to be. I don't know if ministry is what I'm called to do. I need to stop, pray, figure this out. And so we, we stepped back from that position. Actually, within six months of us making that choice, everybody on staff there had left. And I think now Pastor Nick has gone on, and he's doing great, but he's not at Timber Ridge either. Uh, Timber Ridge continues to thrive. Uh, they are still going today as we speak. But I had stepped back. I thought, I'm going to go ahead and finish that undergraduate degree. I had started working, and I hadn't had time, so I finished it. During that time, there was a little church in Glen Rose, Texas, that needed a part-time youth guy. And I thought, well, that's perfect. I'm going to school. I've got a family. Part-time, that'll be great. So I meet with Pastor Owen. Everything's wonderful. Pastor Owen never says anything to me about where he's a pastor at. And so I show up. They invite our family to a church service. And I'm like, oh, cool. This is a Methodist church. I had no experience at all in a Methodist church at all. We go, they're the most wonderful people you'll ever meet. Now, there are some theological differences. I wouldn't say that a lot of them are like hills that I would die on. Um, And so it wasn't an issue for me as the youth guy. Now, I had candid conversations with Pastor Owen about, you know, there are some things that I'm just not going to stand before Jesus with because I told the kid that because I just, that's not my conviction. And that was okay. We experienced growth at Glen Rose. When we started, there were about three students. When we left, there were about 33, 35 students. And so things were growing, headed in the right direction. Um, but savings had run out, and it was time for Clay to have a full-time job. I've got three daughters. Uh, that's, that's what I need to do. And so uh, Glen Rose was a small church, um, and they, just, they didn't have the budget to be able to bring somebody else on staff. They wanted to. Uh, but they couldn't. So we talked about that. And I started looking for places for for me to serve. And so I saw a a job posting in Lawrence, Kansas. And I thought, well, I'll I'll, I'll send my my name to that one, but I'm putting zero stock in that because I've been to Kansas before and it's not not a garden spot. So uh, through that process, I meet Pastor Alex, come to find out we knew some of the same people from me serving at Timber Ridge and him serving in his previous spot. So we knew the same people. We kind of had a little bit of the same ministry philosophy. And so the stars aligned, and I go to Lawrence, and we start working and doing ministry together. We've got an older uh, congregation there. We want to try to grow younger. Uh, We want to be able to connect with people better in our community, inside the church, assimilation, all of these things. So I'm going to come and do that, and we get to work. And I get there in March. And then in July, as you guys know, he came here. And so in that time, I've been at River City Church kind of in an uh, interim pastor capacity um, while they search for a new lead pastor. So when Alex was talking earlier about he offered me that position and I said no, at that point, uh, I didn't feel like that would be an appropriate thing for me to do. There was, uh, the church was in a, an, inter- an interim uh, season of life. Uh, They didn't know what they were going to do, and I just couldn't leave them without a leader. And so we continued to serve. I've been in charge of everything at the church, so preaching and teaching on Sundays, uh, curriculum, people, uh, all of the things. And so through that process, they have now gotten to a point where I think they're pretty close to having a leader that will be there on a full-time basis, which is why I called Alex and said, okay, is that still available? Because I'm not leaving someone in a lurch at this point. And so that gets us to today. And I've been here this weekend. I have met with a lot of people. I tell everyone it's been organized chaos, but it has been such a joy to meet and talk to people who are on mission. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, 
I've had a lot of questions about, man, you were here for a year, you were here for a year, what, what's, what's going to change here? And my answer to that is this. It's about mission and it's about vision. I love Pastor Alex. I worked with him for a solid four months, <laughs> right? But I'm not going to move my family across the country for Pastor Alex. But I will move my family across the country for a body of believers who's on mission, who's about reaching people for Jesus. I'll move tomorrow to be a part of that. And so that's why we're talking today, and I'm a candidate for that position. It's not because of Pastor Alex. Now, he's a delight, and he certainly helps. But if it wasn't Pastor Alex and it was Pastor Joe, whoever, and they were about that mission, and most importantly, that your church elder and elders and leadership were also a part of that mission and about that vision, Clay would be here anyways. And so we're going to talk about that. Like today, we, we talked about Matthew 28 and the Great Commission. So what does that have to do with any of this today, right? Well, it has to do with mission and vision. We often hear that passage of Scripture and we think global missions. We're supposed to go out and tell the good news to everybody out there. And that's true, but that's not all we're talking about. There's a mission field in Longview, Texas, right outside these doors. There's a mission field right down the road in Tyler, Texas, just outside these doors. And if a church is made up of a group of people who are mission-minded, there's a ton of people like me looking for somebody to pour into them. And it matters. Eternity hangs in the balance because of what we do as a church body and as a church family. If somebody hadn't cared enough to pour into me, God only knows where I would be today. I certainly would almost guarantee I wouldn't be standing on a stage telling you about why telling people about Jesus is so important to me, right? And it's not just about me. I've got three kids who were headed for a, a life without a dad pointing them to Jesus, which affects their kids and their kids and their kids. It's a generational thing. Why? Because somebody said, do you want to come help us work on the bathroom? We've got chicken eat. Right? It wasn't this huge theologically deep situation. It was some men that just cared about me. And so if there was me in that church, there's a lot of me's everywhere. That's why it matters. That's why we do what we do. Right? And so it's important for us to know as believers of Jesus, as followers of Christ, what's our mission? He's pretty clear about it in this passage of Scripture. This isn't something that you need to go home and pray about with your spouse. Uh, this isn't something that you need to meditate on. Jesus said, do it. You need to do it, right? He's telling his disciples, but that also, if it's good for them, it's good for us. And so he says, go, therefore, and make disciples, baptize them, teach them the things I've taught you. So we don't have to talk about that part. Jesus said it. We should do it. That's our mission as believers, right? Secondly, what's our mission as a body of believers, as a church family? It's different. It's different for everybody. We all have the same big mission, but how are we going to get there, right? It's kind of like, uh, for us older people, it's like maps. For you younger people, it's about apps, right? So we could all be headed to the same place, but I use an iPhone, so I have Apple Maps, the superior product, I will say. My wife uses an Android, so she has Google Maps, not superior, right? <laughs> we're going to get to the same place eventually, but we're probably going to take a different route. Hers will be longer, we'll have more construction, and we'll be worse, just overall, right? Mine will be straight to the point, succinct and perfect, right? We're all going to the same place. How we get there matters. And so what's your vision, what's your mission as a local church? It matters. So the mission here is what? The mission here at Fellowship Bible Church is this. We exist to worship God, to share Jesus, and to build believers. Guys, let me tell you, there's not a better mission that you could come up with. Also, let me tell you this. It's not normal for every church to have one that is that laser focused. It's not. It's easy to get caught up in the things and uh, the processes and 
the philosophies, right? It's not often you find a church that's like, we exist. Like our whole purpose is to worship God, share Jesus, and build up believers. That's what we do, right? And each of these things points, like they're valid, and they all point to what Jesus called us to do in the Great Commission. Now, if you've got a church mission statement that contradicts what Jesus said, I'm going to go out on a limb and tell you your mission statement probably needs to change. But this, this one lines up perfectly with what Jesus has called his disciples and for us to do. We're to go and share Jesus with people, build believers. That means as a church, we're called to be a hospital for the sick. We're called to be a place where truth is shared in love, a place where there's restoration and healing. That's what we're called to be. That's what we're called to do. And so we've talked about that. So now we know as believers of Jesus what our mission is, right? He's commanded us to go out and share that good news. We know what our mission is as a church here in Longview. We're, to, we're, we're here to worship God, share Jesus, and build believers. So how do we do that? What does that look like? Well, I'm glad you asked. I've got a couple of ideas on that, right? So there's a lot of things that churches can do, but we're going to talk about three things that I think are vitally important when we're working together as brothers and sisters in Christ to share that good news, right? To be that place of discipleship and healing and restoration. And the first thing is this. We need to meet people where they are. And I'll go over these three real quick, and then we'll kind of drill down into them. We need to meet people where they are. Number two, we make people feel welcome and wanted. And then number three, we, uh, we help people get connected to the body, right? So number one, make, uh, meet people where they are. Everybody always asks me, when I come to do a training about recruiting or getting people connected, like, what's the secret sauce? And there's not. There's not a secret sauce. People are people no matter where you're at. Now, not everything that works at one church will work at another one, but people are people everywhere you go. It's all about relationships. All about relationships. Everything starts with a relationship. How do we make those relationships with people outside of this room? The people in this room are important. Don't mishear me when I talk about reaching people for Jesus. That's my passion, right? That's my focus. But I also understand that the people in this room are important too. Discipleship needs to happen. But how do we move outside of this room? How do we get into the community? We have to meet people where they're at. I think the church today has a, a mental block. We think if we put out a banner or we put out some signs, people are just going to come in the door. And the farther we progress as a society and the more post-modern or post-Christian we become, the less and less that's going to happen. It's going to be increasingly more difficult to get lost Larry off the street to come into your building in a place where he's not comfortable and give Jesus a shot. He's not going to do it. And so what do we do? We need to form relationships with people that believe differently than us outside of this room. When's the last time you had somebody in your home who wasn't a believer? When's the last time you invited somebody over to watch the game that didn't know Jesus? You're not going to have a relationship with somebody or an opportunity to share your faith if you don't ever talk to somebody that thinks or believes differently than you, right? Now, you also have to be careful that the second that that person starts to turn you from Jesus and you're not pointing them to Jesus, you need to evaluate that situation, right? We don't want to get drugged down into the way a lost person lives, uh, their priorities are different. Everything is different. But we need to be pointing them to Jesus. And we can't point lost people to Jesus if we don't know lost people. And so we need to meet people where they're at. We should not expect people to meet us here. They're not going to do it. They're not. Sadly, the church is more known for what we're against than what we're for. And we've got a history of treating people poorly that don't believe the same way we do. Now, I'm not saying that everything is permissible at church. That's far from what I'm saying. But I am saying that we're called to share the truth in love. There is absolute truth. There are things that are wrong, and it's okay to say that's not okay. But the way we tell somebody that makes a huge difference. So we meet people where they're at. We don't expect them to come here. And we should act in a way that shows grace and that shares the truth in love. Nobody's going to come into your church 
and want to stay here if you spend the entire time pointing your finger at them and telling them how they screwed up. They get plenty of that outside the church, right? Now, there's an appropriate time to speak into someone's life, but again, it goes back to relationship. If you don't have a relationship with that person, they're not going to be receptive to what you have to say. When we have a relationship with somebody, with a rapport with someone, we, we have that opportunity. They're going to see something different about us. Why do you treat me like that? That's weird. Like, that's countercultural. What's the deal? And then you get to share your story. People get freaked out when I talk about evangelism. They're like, well, I'm not made for that. I'm, I'm not equipped. I don't, I don't want to go out there and share Jesus. And I get it. Like, I don't go out on the street corner with my portable speaker and preach about Jesus, right? That's, I think, also weird and awkward. But if somebody were to say, if I were to share how to share Jesus with someone, it's simple. This is my life before Jesus. I met Jesus. This has been my life after Jesus. Now, what they choose to do with that information, that's not up to you. You're not on the hook for that. The Holy Spirit is in charge of working and moving in that person's life and creating heart change and life change. Oftentimes, we get so caught up in what are they going to say, how are they going to respond, that we don't remain obedient to share the story. You're not that important. Jesus is. And Jesus can get through to the most rank, vile toughest skinned person there is. I am living proof to that. I was antagonistic, militaristic, vehemently against somebody telling me what Jesus thought I should do. Immediately shut down. But somebody creates a relationship with me, and all of a sudden, things are different, right? And so we need to meet people where they're at. People don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. Relationship, that's what it boils down to. How else can we reach people outside of this, this building, outside of these walls? We find a practical need in our community, and we meet it. That's it. Jesus and his disciples would do that all the time. Now, Jesus did miracles, but Jesus would find people. They were hurting. They were sick. They needed something practical in their life addressed, and he did it. And then he would share with them the truth. We try to make it complicated. Like, what's your ministry philosophy? What are your, what's your three points on how to do outreach? Like, it, it's, we make it too hard. Find a practical need, meet that need, expect nothing in return, share Jesus. There's your discipleship. There's your outreach, right? That's what we should do. Number two, if we want to be a church on mission, we need to make people feel welcome and wanted. This is something, when I go and I train and I teach and I talk about hospitality, it blows my mind for church people and church leaders to be blown away by this statement. Because if somebody feels welcome and wanted at Fellowship Bible Church, then they know they're welcome and wanted in the kingdom. And if we fail at that, we put ourselves at a huge disadvantage for reaching people for Jesus. They should be able to come here and know that we've prepared for them, that we've expected them, and that we care for them. And it doesn't matter if they never come back, if they never give tithe. I come from a college church, and that was a big deal. College students don't have money. But even if they never give a cent, that's okay. We love you because Jesus loves you. Those people come back. Those people, those people want to get involved. Those people want to get connected, right? That's why we make people feel welcome and wanted. That's what changes people from an, a renter mentality to an owner mentality at church. Renters, think about it. Renters are there for a short amount of time. It's not their stuff, so it doesn't really matter what happens to it. I'll just throw away my deposit. The landlord will fix it. But an owner, an owner is different. They think long-term. What's going to happen when I'm gone? Who's going to take this when I'm not here? We need this to be nice so when we have family over, it looks good, right? They can't just push it off on someone else. So when somebody feels welcome and wanted at church, then they start to feel that ownership mentality, and it changes the whole dynamic of their relationship to the church and to the community and to others inside the building. Like, there's no secret sauce. I put this in my notes. There's no secret sauce when it comes to people 
feeling welcome and wanted. It's simple things. Smile at somebody when they come in the door, right? You guys know, you go out in the world every single day, it's a beatdown. It's a mental beatdown, right? The last thing you want to do is to see grumpy Groucho at the door, right? Newsflash, most Sundays, well, not most, but a lot of Sundays, Heather's been giving me the right act, what for, on the way to church. If I take that out of the car and I stand at the door and I'm like, welcome, people are like, whoa, what's wrong with that guy, right? So just smile at people. Something crazy, ask somebody how their day is. Just ask them how they're doing. You know how often that happens in the real world? Not very. If you know someone, sure. Like, hey, how you doing? Now, when I say that, I'm not really expecting you to tell me how you're doing. It's just like a customary saying, right? But if you really mean it, that connects with people on a personal level. Like, what's different about that guy? What's going on with him? Maybe they think you're crazy. <laughs> but what they don't think is that you don't care about them, right? The last thing I'll talk about when I talk about making people feel welcome and wanted, on my office, I used to have a, a, a plaque, and it said, remember today, somebody is giving Jesus a chance for the last time, and somebody may be giving Jesus a chance for the first time. If you approach people at church or in your life with that in your mind, it'll completely change the way you interact with people. What if that person that looks a little different, that might be a little grumpy at church today, is at his wit's end. If something doesn't change, he's going to go home, and God forbid, he'll take his own life. Or he's going to make a horrible decision that impacts himself and others for a long time. And we did something that caused a disconnect with him, and we missed an opportunity. Now, same guy. What happens if he comes in through the doors, we greet him, we're smiling, we're glad he's here. How can we get you connected? How can we pray for you? What can we do? And that guy goes home and he tells his family, there's something different about those people. I'm going to go check it out more. I don't trust them yet, but I'm going to go check this out because these people are crazy. And then through that, he keeps coming to church. We keep pouring into him. And then eventually he accepts Jesus. Then he goes home and he tells his wife, and she sees such a crazy change in her husband that she accepts Jesus. And then the kids come to know Jesus because their family is different. How did that happen and how did it start? Good morning, how are you today? Smile on my face. What you do matters. I never want to hear anybody say at church, I just serve coffee. I'm just on the parking team. I just teach Sunday school. Absolutely not, no way. What you do matters. Eternity hangs in the balance. Because of your obedience, people have the opportunity to come into contact with Jesus, have a relationship with him, and experience life change because you made coffee and made an environment where somebody felt welcome and wanted. That's what matters. That's why we do what we do. And lastly, we help people connect to the body. This isn't just new believers. It is for new believers, but it's also for new people that come and see our church, that come and want to find community and be a part of the body. Like, why do we do that? Why do we talk about people getting connected? Why does it matter? Well, people are a lot like chickens. And I don't know if you know a lot about chickens, but I'm from farm country in Texas, and we had some chickens and peanuts. And so chickens, uh, they're made for community. They're made to be together. If you have chickens, see, you don't even say it right. If you have a chicken, which you shouldn't, there should be more than one, but they'll start picking their feathers out. They'll get stressed out, right? They have distress calls. If you think chickens are annoying with a group, you should hear a chicken by itself. It's awful. That usually becomes dinner, that chicken. Um, they have decreased egg, egg production. They're lethargic. They kind of mope around. It's awful. It's awful. There's just overall malaise and poor health. They're actually more prone and susceptible to disease. They're not made to live by themselves. We're the same way. We were created to be in community. And that's why it is so critical and important that when somebody comes to check out Fellowship Bible Church or whatever church it is, that we get them connected. In my experience, most churches are very focused on evangelism. 
We want to share Jesus. We want to share the good news. And then once that happens, we're like, cool, box checked, on to the next one. And we forget that lost Larry that just came to know Jesus is standing there holding all his new Jesus gear going, what do I do now? That's discipleship. We drop the ball as a church on that a lot. And I think part of it is because we try to make it real complicated. We need a curriculum. We need a a study done on it. How are we going to do discipleship? What's our four points, right? I really think, as in most things, just look at the scripture. If Jesus did it, follow his example. And Jesus discipled people, right? The last, the the entire part of his ministry, he had 12 screw-ups with him that he was trying to disciple and leave it to them when when he was gone, right? Jesus was very, it was very simple. Come and see and follow me. That's what he did, right? He would find people that were complete screw-ups or from other walks of life. Not one person who was a disciple of Jesus was from the religious class, technically, right? It was regular, everyday people who were willing to follow him. He showed them, come and see and follow me. That's what we should be as a church. You don't have to have it figured out. You don't have to have a degree in missiology. You don't have to have a degree in whatever ology it is. Do you love Jesus? Are you a believer in Jesus? Then let's get to work. What are your interests? Where are you, where, I mean, you don't plug a square peg into a round hole. I get that. But if somebody has a heartbeat and they know Jesus, they need to be serving. That's another one of those, you don't need to go home and pray about it. Jesus said, do it. You need to do it. If we're believers of Jesus, we need to be on mission serving Jesus, helping share and spread that message, or building believers who are a part of the, of, the, of the body. That's what we need to be about. So it's critical that we get new people and new members involved in our churches. We need to have follow-up processes for these people. Like I said, you don't want lost Larry or new Nate come to church, and then he hears from crickets, right? Right? We can't let people fall through the cracks. That points back to making people feel welcome and wanted. If you come to church and you sign up and nobody calls you back and nobody tries to help you get involved, do you feel welcome and wanted at church? No. Therefore, are you going to be apt to think that you're welcome and wanted in the kingdom? No. These things seem small, but they're huge. Small groups. It's important that you have small groups. It has been a breath of fresh air and a blessing to see the groups at Fellowship Bible Church. People together pouring over scripture, learning, sharing, walking through life together. That's important because it's community. That's where we we work through trials. We celebrate wins, right? There comes a point where Pastor Alex and I, we can't be everything to all people. And if you expect that now, let me tell you, you're going to be disappointed. There comes a point where a lot of ministry happens in those groups, guys. It's so important that you have that. It's not my job to monopolize the ministry of the church. It's my job to equip and empower the saints to go out and to share the good news and to reach people for the lost. And that happens a lot in groups. Iron sharpens iron, right? You have somebody that you can bounce things off of, talk to, cry to, with joy with. Groups are so important. Bible studies, we talked about that. That's how we strengthen and grow our faith. It's so important that we get people plugged in to the body. And then, like we talked about, opportunities to serve. Serving in the church isn't something that you should do. It's something that you're called to do, right? Each and every person in this room was uniquely created with a talent and skill set that some, no one else in here has. So if you're breathing, God has a purpose for you. If you're in this room, there's a place for you in the kingdom. There's a place for you in this church. It's my job to help you find that place. It's my job to get you connected to that place. But you have one. If you're a part of our legacy group, right, or our older, more wise and experienced people, you're not too old to be used by Jesus. Again, if you're breathing and you're in this room, Jesus isn't done with you. If you think you've screwed up so bad that Jesus couldn't use you, I am living proof that that is not true. I did everything short of philander on my wife to be a bad husband. 
I was emotionally absent. I was physically absent. I did awful things. And yet, but Jesus. It's painful to share that story, but if God can use that for one person ever to hear, maybe I haven't screwed up as bad as that guy, and look what he's saying about Jesus, then I'll tell that story every time I get a chance. God's not done with you. You are important and special. The music, I could want to play drums all day. I do. I think that's so cool. Doesn't matter. I wasn't gifted for that. But you are. Thank God you are. And you are willing and obedient to share that. That's why it's important we get people connected. Right? Life change happens when we work together to reach people for Jesus. And we can't do that if we're not all on mission together. And here at Fellowship Bible Church, that's one thing that I know for sure is you're about that mission. You have that vision. You have a group of leadership that knows that that's the way we need to head. How do we do that best? How do we get everybody on board to come and reach Longview for Jesus? How do we take that impact and move it to a statewide thing and then to a worldwide thing? It doesn't, it's not if you think it's possible, then you're not giving God enough credit. You need to think something that you, wow, that's crazy. That can never happen. That's where God steps in. So how do we do that as a church? I think we've listed a few ways. Again, I'd like to thank everybody today for their hospitality, welcoming me and my family into Longview, driving me around. Gosh, I'm not that interesting, but just talking to me the whole time. Most importantly, asking me questions, making sure what I believe and why I believe it before you bring me here to talk to your people. That's another testament to leadership and who you are as a church. It matters who you let speak to your people. So thank you for that. I look forward to, even if I'm not the guy, getting to call and check in and see how is Fellowship Bible Church doing? How are, how are you guys doing with that mission? How, how's it going? Right? I just, again, want to thank each and every one of you for giving me the opportunity to come today, and I think that there are nothing but bright days ahead and lives changed for Jesus in Longview. Would you guys pray with me? Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity to come and be with your people today, God. I just pray that you would heap blessings upon them, Father, that you would send the people uh, that you would have here, God, that you would... Start to tune people's ear to your voice, God, that you would draw people uh, to you and to Fellowship Bible Church, and that when they get here, they would be ready, Father, to, to show them that they are welcome and wanted and get them connected, God. I pray that you would just bless each and every person that gives selflessly and tirelessly, and they serve God, that you would just show them how important and, and needed that they are, God. I pray that you would give Fellowship Bible Church discernment as they head into the future, God, and that you would again, just continually bless them. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Uh, well, Clay is nothing uh, uh, if he's not passionate uh, about reaching um, our neighbors uh, here in Longview. And so thank you, Clay, for being with us this weekend. Uh, would you stand with me? Uh, we're about to read our benediction together. I'm going to ask the Smith family if they'll just step out to the lobby uh, with me here. And so uh, you'll have an opportunity to greet them uh, out there and meet them in the lobby. And just want to remind you, we'll be back here this afternoon at 3.30 for a congregation meeting. Hope that you can join us there. Um, let me, let's read this benediction together. The words will be on the screen. Uh, Father, help us to live this week to the full being true to you in every way. Jesus, help us to give ourselves away to others, being kind to everyone we meet. And Holy Spirit, help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do and say. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.